Well, good morning. It is 10 o'clock and I am using a different software. So I hope that this is going through and that you can hear it. And uh, I hope that you're enjoying this beautiful rainy Lord's Day. And I want to thank you for joining me today here on Facebook Live for another message from our champion series. And as we have been going through the book of Esther, we have found that for such a time as this, is the famous quote from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verse 14. And, you know, when we think about this whole series, the intention behind this, this series and the reason why I felt led to do it is because, you know, we have found ourselves in a place of uncertainty. And I mean, you know, life's always full of uncertainties, but even more so now when you consider all of the things that are going on in the culture. And so I felt that we needed some inspiration. We needed to be reminded again that we are the people of God and that the people of God, we always have hope and our our faith and trust are in Jesus Christ. And regardless of what this world throws at us, regardless of where we find ourselves, the anchor holds, the anchor holds and the firm foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who promised to never leave us nor forsake us and said that he would be with us until the end of the age. And we're constantly reminded of, in Scripture that God's people suffer. And we see the example of so many people who suffered through various ages and times and places. And people who stood in dark times, but who still stood on the word of the Lord. And they were protected, they were delivered, and they went through all kinds of challenging uh, aspects of their lives. And so today, I hope that as we continue to go through the series, that it will remind you of this and that we will find inspiration from God's word to meet us in these challenging times. And before we go any further, I just want to have prayer. And then I have some announcements that I want to share with you before we get into today's message. So let's pray together. Father God, I praise you in the name of Jesus and thank you for this opportunity and this occasion, Lord, to be gathered here. Lord, on Facebook Live with our church. And Lord, these are challenging times and we find ourselves going through um, all kinds of questions in our minds of what's around the corner and what a year 2020 has been. We have experienced uh, things that we have never experienced before, unprecedented uh, moments in time. And Lord, we just, we need your guidance. We need the inspiration of your spirit, Lord. We need the wisdom of your spirit. We need the discernment of your spirit, Lord, to enable us to be able to stand in these challenging times. And so, Lord, I just pray for everyone who's watching today, Lord, I pray that your word would encourage us, that it would inspire us, that it would challenge us, convict us, Lord, and that we would find ourselves wrestling in the tension and asking ourselves the hard questions as we consider your presence in our lives. Lord, let us remember that you did not adopt us and bring us into the fold, Lord, to just sit idle, but you have called us all for various purposes and various reasons. And Lord, especially when we think about where we are today, in light of where we are today, for such a time as this, Lord Jesus, what are you asking us to do? What are you showing us to do, Lord? And so we have opportunities around us to continue to carry out your mission and Lord, let us not be uh, uh, blinded uh, by the distractions and the things that are around us, Lord, but help us to focus in and to stay focused and to stay determined, to stay dedicated to the calling you have placed upon our lives, Lord. Help us to stay humble in all that we do, reminding ourselves that anything that we have today has been because of your good hand. You have been so gracious and good to us. And so, Lord, I pray today that as we partake of the bread of life, that, Lord, it would nurture our spirits, that it would remind us of who we are, and that, Lord, we would find strength in that. And I ask it all today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So I do want to say happy birthday to somebody. Today is Dane Horrell's birthday, and most of us know who Dane is, and uh, we are so blessed to have him among us. And he is a to such a blessing, been such a blessing to my life and to so many others. So happy birthday, Dane. I also want to remind you uh, that we do have our men, our fathers and son 
grandfather's grandson's fishing trip coming up this Thursday. Don't forget, there's a $40 cost to participate in that event. If you've not turned your money in, you can do so this week. You can uh, bring it by the church office or you can give it to us on the trip. We'll make sure it gets to where it needs to get to. And we do want to remind you that if you have any questions about anything, you can reach out to Dane. Most of you have his contact information or you can reach out to me. You can message us right here on Facebook for any questions you may have. And uh, But we're excited about the opportunity and most of us will be taking off Thursday at noon. I will be driving the bus down, so if you want to ride on the bus, you can bring your gear and all those things. Just know that we will be leaving early Saturday morning to come back. So um, if you want to ride on the bus, that opportunity is available to you. So we look forward to that time together, and we know it's going to be an awesome experience. And so we just uh, are looking forward to all that the Lord will do while we're on that trip together. I went last year, and it was just a great opportunity. So... Anyways, keep those things in your prayers. So let's get into today's message. So we've been going through the book of Esther, and we've been looking at the courage of this orphaned girl who was, we find out in the story that she was orphaned. Her parents were probably taking in during the Babylonian captivity, and Mordecai, her cousin, ends up raising her. He takes her and raises her, and... uh, and protects her and keeps her and all those things. And, and now they find themselves uh, with a lot of Jews who did not go back to Jerusalem and to Israel under the edict of Cyrus the Great. And they didn't go back. So there, was, there were you know probably millions of Jews that didn't go back. In fact, I think there was only 50,000 that actually went back to Israel and to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and to rebuild the temple and so on and so forth. So Esther serves as a book for us that gives us a snapshot of what life was like in exile. And so here we are under the rule of Xerxes, and he is referred to in the book of Esther as Asherus, and um, or however you want to pronounce his name. I've heard it pronounced so many different ways. Uh, but Asherus, Asherus, is king, and we saw in chapter one that he throws two parties. Um, one essentially lasts for six months, and the other one lasts for seven days. And many scholars believe that the purpose for the first meeting um, was to gather all of those rulers throughout the provinces of the Persian Empire that stretched all the way from Ethiopia to India. And uh, it's pretty much modern day Iran there in Susa, which is Susa today. And they, you know, they believed that there was the threat of the Greeks that was coming against them. Philip of Macedon, who was the father of Alexander the Great, was making great headway. And it was a conquer, be conquered kind of world. And so they were experiencing the threat of the Greeks coming against them. And they, uh, you know, maybe during that six-month period were making plans on how to defeat the Greeks. And they actually do fight a battle, the Battle of Thermopylae. And that is a very historic battle that uh, there was a movie made about it, 300. Um, you can go look into all those things on your own. I won't get into all that now. Suffice it to say that during that time, during the seven-day party, We're told that the king, now feeling pretty good about himself, he has paraded about all of his wealth to all those who are there. He has shown off all of his uh, great might. And now he wants to show off his great trophy wife. And he, he asked for Vashti to come and for Vashti to come and to display her beauty for all who were there. And, you know, and that's not said about Vashti. Vashti shows great courage here. She refuses to go. She, she is not going to be paraded around as his property. And with that being said, we, uh, we're, we're, we're told that she says, no, I'm not going. And that's great courage because she could have died. She could have died because of this. And she 
doesn't go. And so the king, this king already has anger issues. So in order to try to um, stop him from getting angry and flying off the handle and doing only God knows what, they put together a little coalition to hold a beauty pageant to find the next queen. And this is where Esther comes into the story. Her name literally means star. That's her Persian name. There's a lot that could be said about that. Um, some believe it's a reference to the Babylonian god Ishtar, um, or goddess, I should say, the goddess Ishtar. Um, but Esther is now coming into the picture. It's where we learn about her. Um, she is uh, part of the king's uh, harem, and she makes it into uh, the qualifications to be part of this beauty pageant they're going to have because they t the scripture tells us that she is lovely and beautiful. So she's not only beautiful on the outside, she has this inward quality about her. She's, she's lovely. She is a lovely person. And she finds favor with the, with the eunuch who's over the harem. And she gets to be prepared to spend a night with the king. And that's like a you know, bachelor episode that you might watch on TV today. Uh, you know, she gets a night, an opportunity to spend a night with the king. And she ends up finding favor with him and she becomes queen. And Mordecai, in the meantime, her cousin is got some kind of position in the king's court because he's allowed to uh, move about in the court of the king. And so he's probably a judge of some kind. And so there he is. He's able to keep in close contact with Esther. And there, as we saw Wednesday night, for those of you who were there for our Bible study together Wednesday night, we saw that the villain of the story comes into play. Uh, Haman is his name. He is somebody who has risen to a place of power in the king's court. He's basically the second one in charge. Um, so he has great authority. And we're told that all of the, the people are to bow to him and to pay him honor and respect because of his position. And so Haman uh, does not get this kind of treatment from Mordecai. Mordecai refuses to bow to him. And Mordecai, uh, because you know, many speculate that it's because of his allegiance to God, um, being faithful uh, to the second commandment, um, to not bow um, to any image. And so Haman or Mordecai will not bow to Haman. And this, of course, just makes Haman, who is a very prideful and arrogant, boastful kind of guy. Uh, he can't stand the fact that this one guy, he has all these people who bow and honor him, but one won't, and he can't stand it. And, of course, he comes up with a decree that the king basically gives him his ring and says, you know, do what you want to. I trust you. And... He makes a decree that not only Mordecai, but that all the Jews will die. And he puts this decree out, and it goes throughout all the land. You can read about all this in Esther chapter 3. It goes throughout all the land. And basically, on the appointed day, all the Jews are to be killed. And even the people of the empire are taken aback by this, that you're going to let this happen? But it's a decree that goes out, and they'll have to do what it says because it comes from the king, from his signet ring. And so this is where we are in the story today in chapter 4. And Mordecai has heard about this. And let's just get into chapter 4 here. It says, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Now, God's name is never mentioned in this book, but we can assume right here that Mordecai is crying out to God. He's put on sackcloth and ashes, which is something that Jewish people did back then to show that they were lamenting and mourning and that they were in distress. And this is what Mordecai is doing here. And 
It says that he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. So that was basically against the law. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So all the Jews are mourning at this decree. You can't help but think of Nazi Germany when the rumors were going through the Jewish community as they were being gathered up and put into these ghettos. The Jews were being exterminated in these concentration camps, and they were hearing about all of these things. And you can't help but think about that, at least I can't when I read this. And so they're wailing and, and they're, they're in distress because they all know they're going to die. You talk about a place of uncertainty. And again, we can assume that they are wailing before the Lord. Anytime in Scripture you see somebody tearing their clothes, putting on sackcloth and ashes and weeping and wailing, we can't really understand what that is. But for any place in Scripture where you see this taking place, they are weeping and wailing before the Lord. So Esther's maids and eunuchs, this is verse 4 of chapter 4. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. And then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him. But he would not accept them. So there's speculation amongst the scholarship that I've looked at that is Esther embarrassed by Mordecai? Is she trying to send clothes to him to say, come on, man, chill out. You know, you're going to get yourself in trouble here. Get off those sackcloth and ashes and put on these clothes. Like he doesn't have any clothes. Here, put these on. So we don't know if she's ashamed or if she's trying to say, you know, come on, get up and, and, and get yourself out of this. We don't really know what her intentions are, but Mordecai refuses them. He refuses to take them because he's so distressed. He can't even begin to imagine putting those clothes on. So verse 5, then Esther called Hathak one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hethik went out to Mordecai in the city square and was in front of the king's gate and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasures to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Sushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hethik returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And then Esther spoke to Hethik and gave him a command for Mordecai. Now, it's almost like Esther here is getting... You know, she's going to make the excuses. She's put two and two together, and she's thinking, I already know what you're going to ask me. So let's listen to her here. And by the way, this is, you know, Esther is speaking now. So much of what we have read in the story of Esther is, you know, a, a narrative narrator telling us all of these things. But here Esther begins speaking. And she says in verse 11, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner courts of the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So see, here, here's her excuse. I know what you're asking me, but I can't. Because it's against the law. I cannot go in there. And so verse 12, so they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. This could be that this is Mordecai saying that it's going to come from another place. God's deliverance is going to come from another place. But you and your father's house, he says, will perish. 
Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai has trust, obviously, in something greater than this whole kingdom of Persia. He knows that they will be delivered one way or another. But Esther and her refusal to do this, he's saying you and your father's household will be destroyed. And he says there the the um, you know the, the infamous words there that perhaps you have become queen for such a time as this. We have been talking about the providential hand of God in this story. Though his name is never mentioned, it is obvious that he is orchestrating and working things together for his purposes. Remember, this is the race of people through whom the fulfillment of his covenant with Abraham will be fulfilled, that all of the nations of the world will be blessed because of you, and that ultimately will be that holy seed of Jesus that will come through the Jewish people. The Jewish Messiah will come onto the scene of the world, and through his sacrificial death, God will make a new covenant. Through the sacrifice of his blood, God will make a new covenant with the world for all to be saved, not just the Jews, but for everyone who believes. And that will come through these people. And perhaps Mordecai is referencing that he knows that, that God is faithful to keep his promises. And his promises have not been fulfilled yet. And so here he's telling her, that you know what, perhaps you have become queen for this reason. Perhaps God has put you in this place. God has worked things out. Look at you. You were an orphan girl. Your parents were exiled. Look at you. Look at me. Look at the state that we were in. But here in this place, look at the positions we have now. And look at you. You're the queen. You are queen. I mean, that's mind-blowing to think about. It's a true rags to riches story here. And this is what Mordecai is reminding her of. Let's not forget who made you queen. Perhaps God made you queen for such a time as this. So verse 15, we pick it back up. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now, we have to ask ourselves, God's not mentioned, but why would they fast? The scholarship on this is interesting because, you know, we know that this is backslidden Israel that is still in exile here. These are people who remained uh, in the Persian Empire who didn't go back. And God's name is not mentioned, which could signify to the fact of their backslidden state. But it's very apparent when fasting and sackcloth and ashes and mourning and weeping and these kinds of things are taking place, what are they going to fast for? What are they going to fast for? You know, are they going to fast because they're placing their faith in Esther? No, because she says, if I perish, I perish. She knows that there's a great possibility that she could die. She is literally laying it all on the line right here. And she calls for a fast. Prayer is never mentioned. But again, I think that we can assume that prayer is happening. I believe they're praying. I believe they're asking God. I mean, when you find yourself in these places where you are distressed, where you are mourning, where you are weeping before God, seeking his face because of the place you found yourself in, because of the place we might find ourselves in. And this is your state. that You are calling out to him and now you're fasting. What is it saying about you? What is this saying about your faith? It's saying that your faith and your trust are in someone greater than yourself. And for them, I believe 100% it was for God, for God to intervene. 
And Mordecai was probably praying those kinds of prayers. Lord, it's so obvious that you orchestrated these events. I mean, look at where we are today. We know where we were, but look at where we are now. And look at what's happening. Now we got this evil guy who's trying to kill our people. He's going to kill he's going to kill us. I mean, when an, when an edict goes forward, it can't be reversed. This is why the king had to find another queen. He couldn't reverse it. If we'll remember, in chapter 2, he kind of regrets the fact that he dismissed Vashti. But the edict had gone forward. He couldn't reverse it. And so here this edict has gone forward, and they can't reverse it. And they are in a very desperate place. Very desperate place. And she says, fast for me. In other words, fast and pray for me that God will give me the strength. Give me the courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the presence of fear and going forward in fear. And that's Esther. She's still going to go forward in that fear. If I perish, I perish. She knows very well that that could be the outcome of this. But she's going to do it for the sake of her people. She's going to lay it all on the line for the sake of her people. And as we continue to go forward, we're just going to finish up this chapter here. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So Esther has obeyed Mordecai throughout this story so far. Mordecai told her not to reveal your identity. Keep your identity hidden. Don't reveal your identity. And, and she obeyed him. She was obedient to those commands by him. In other words, Mordecai was saying, listen, there are some things better left unsaid. There, there's a bigger issue going on here. There's a bigger picture. Look at the opportunity you have. Now, it says that she was taken into the harem, you know, back early in the story. It says she was taken into the harem. She's a slave. And she's taken into the harem. And, but she's going to get an opportunity to be the queen. So, in other words, you're finding the good in the midst of the bad. And it's kind of like the story of Joseph as we, as we have gone through through this champion series. And we looked at him as a figure of a champion of scripture. No matter the situation Joseph found himself in, he always found an opportunity for God to be glorified. Perhaps this is what Mordecai saw as her ticket out was for her to have a chance to enter this great beauty pageant. But it's obvious that God is working throughout this whole story. Of course he is, because it's going to be through the Jews that the Messiah is going to come. And so this is what I want us to think about today as we consider the story of Esther up to this point. We are told, and I've mentioned here, that she's an orphan. She's raised by her cousin. So an orphan is, you know, helpless. They can do nothing. Uh, children are so dependent on someone to care for them. And Mordecai takes her in. And it says something about him. It says something about his heart being tender. Um, that he takes her in. That he's going to raise her. And we see that <clears throat> through him taking her in, they find themselves in these positions. But they get into some good places and to some important positions. Uh, he being a judge, in fact, he'll be recognized uh, early on in the story, something we haven't talked about, um, Mordecai actually thwarts a coup to overthrow the king. There are two guys who are going to try to take out the king, and Mordecai uh, tells Esther about it, and she tells the king about it and saves his life, basically. And she finds favor, and Mordecai finds favor. And later on, we're going to see that he gets recognized for that. So he's in an important position, and she, too, is in an important position. But here, those positions are being threatened by the evil Haman. 
the adversary, the one who is going to accuse all of the Jews for one man's crime, his failure to bow. And, and, and so what I want us to think about today is this, is let's, let, let's consider this story from a spiritual perspective, okay? Scripture tells us that God has adopted us into his family. Paul talks about this in Galatians, and he also uh, refers to this in his Romans epistle about how we as Gentiles are grafted onto the tree, and then in Ephesians you know, uh, chapter 2, that we who were once dead in sins and trespasses have been, um, though we were far from, from God, have been brought now into the family of God. And we did nothing to earn this, that it was all by grace. For, you know, we're not saved by works, but by grace, Paul says in his Ephesians epistle, chapter 2. So God did something for us that we can never do for ourselves. He has brought us in to his fold. And we're told too by so many places in scripture that God saved us for a purpose. He wants to use our lives to glorify himself through us. And but oftentimes what happens is is we take the salvation but we cling to our lives as if they are ours. We want the forgiveness. We want the grace. We want the protection. We want the provision. We want all the things that God provides and promises to give to those who are his. We want all of those things. And we're willing to sacrifice to an extent. But we still cling to our lives as if they're ours. And to me, this is what Mordecai is reminding Esther of. Listen, girl. You wouldn't be where you are today if it wasn't for the grace of God. Now your people are about to perish, his people. And you need to do this because this is probably why you were put in this position as queen for such a time as this. God knew this was going to happen. And God has placed you in a position for such a time as this to stop this madness, to stop this evil decree. And I think, for you and me, what about us? For such a time as this. I know being a follower of Jesus now for 24 years, and I'm no different than anyone else. I read the Bible. I pray. I seek God's face. I seek His will. And I know that with that, in my journey with Him, and you see this all throughout Scripture, he will bring you to these places to take steps of faith. But you know what you and I do? We sometimes shrivel back in fear because we're afraid to take the step of faith because we don't know what's going to happen. We might perish. We might lose it all. If I reveal that I'm a Christian at my job, I might lose my job. If I reveal that I'm a Christian to my cheerleading squad, I might not be popular anymore. If I reveal that I'm a Christian on my football team, I might not get treated like I'm being treated right now. If I share that I'm a Christian, it's going to cost me something. We keep our identity a secret. Now see, Mordecai told her for a season to not reveal who she was. But here she's going to have to reveal who she is. And she does. We're going to see that. She will do it. And she lays everything out there. She becomes completely transparent. And she lays it all on the line. Let me tell you something. God is going to lead you to lay it all on the line. And don't let fear keep you from being willing to lay it all on the line. Because I can promise you that any time you and I do that, and we take these steps of faith, God honors us just like he's going to honor Esther and Mordecai. At the end of this story, we're going to see there are banquets being held, but this time it's not the king. It's Mordecai and Esther. And there's a lot of celebrating going on. And in fact, Jews celebrate every March this story of Esther, and celebrations are held all around the world through the Jewish community of this story right here. 
And what is that saying to us? That man, Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. And, you know, we can, we can hold back and we can let fear get the best of us. But you're missing out. You are so missing out because of fear. Do you have the courage? Are you a champion? Are you a champion of the faith? Or are you a victim of the faith? Some are victors. Some are victims. Some walk around, oh, woe is me, with a victim mentality. We, our nation is full of victims today. But we have many victims in the Christian community too. Oh, woe is me. Oh, woe is me. They wouldn't take a step of faith for nothing. And I'm just here to encourage you today. We are in this place in this time. Esther and Mordecai were in a place and time. They were faced with challenges. They were faced with the challenge of assimilating into that culture. And perhaps they did. Maybe they did. We don't get all of that in this story. But this is backslidden Israel that has assimilated into the culture. Their gods have become their gods. Their way of life has become their way of life. And you know what? We can assimilate too. We can let the things of our culture become more important to us than the things of God. We can let status become more important to us. We can let jobs and treasures and these things become to mean more to us than our faith. Though we'll say, oh, my faith means everything to me. I love Jesus and we'll post it all over the place or we'll put it on a hat and wear it on a hat or we'll put a thank you Jesus sign out in our front yard. But the truth is, for many of us, we are not victors in Christ. We are victims. Not willing to take the steps of faith. Not willing to let God use our lives. And let me tell you something, it's always radical. When God calls you to take a step of faith, there's always a, a little bit of radical in there. It is. But man, I can tell you that every time you do, you'll be so thankful you did. All of this journey of following Jesus is about steps of faith. It's all about steps of faith. And when you start off, they're baby steps of faith. And then eventually those steps of faith become a little bit more mature steps of faith. And then eventually they will become radical steps of faith. And the little steps prepared you for the big steps of faith. And I want to encourage you to keep stepping. Don't let fear keep you from it. Especially in this time and in this place. And one of the ways that you can take a great step of faith is to go on our Dominican Republic mission trip with us. I am working on putting this trip together, and I would love for you to be a part of this trip. I can't tell you what all it will do for you. I could sit here and paint the picture for you, but you will never experience it until you're willing to take the step of faith and get on a plane and go to another country and go see what God is doing there and how God will use you there, but more importantly, how God will use them to bless you. You'll come back a changed person, I promise you. It's a week out of your life. Don't you think Jesus is worth a week of your life? For you to go down and to partner with missionaries and a great organization like Score International, to go down there and partner and be a part of a mission that's been going on since the late 80s. And God has done so many awesome, awesome things on that island through the ministry of Score International. And we can partner in that. We have an opportunity to do this. If the travel still permits itself and we can continue to go, you need to go on this trip. I don't care how old you are. And you can make your excuses. Some people say, we got our own mission right here to focus on. Well, that's true. But Jesus said, go into all the world. He said to make disciples of all the nations. And we can't forget that. And we can't forget that when God gives us opportunities, we should take them. I love taking people to Dominican Republic. Ron Bishop, the guy who first came and told Shiloh Baptist Church, for me anyways, in my time there, came and told us about Dominican Republic. And his passion for Dominican Republic, I can't speak enough about. 
But let me tell you, his passion was so much that it oozed into our hearts. And you know what? I was scared half to death to go on that first mission trip. I was scared half to death to go because I hate to fly, especially then. I've come a long way, but I hated to fly. I couldn't even stand the thought of flying. I'd never flown before. That's the reason why it was because I was scared out to death to fly. I was, I mean, I'm afraid of heights, period. But to get on a plane and fly, forget about it. But my pastor said to me, he said, you mean to tell me that you're going to let your fear of flying keep you from seeing all that God is doing in the world and to see his beautiful creation around the world? You're going to let your fear of flying a plane or flying, not me flying the plane, praise God, but you flying on a plane keep you from that? And man, I left and I was kind of mad at him because I'm like, gosh, I don't want to do this. But man, I took the step of faith and you know what? Rocked my world. Never gotten over it. I've been taking groups to Dominican Republic since 2002. Every other year. 2002, 4, 6, 8. Well, 8 we went to Costa Rica. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And now we get a chance with a new group to go. And I don't want you to miss this opportunity. Don't make excuses. Be willing to get on a plane and go. So here's here's the 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 cost for the trip. Now, this is this is really good. Um, we can go on this trip for one thousand three hundred ten dollars per person. That I can tell you is a great price. I paid up to fifteen hundred dollars per person to go. The airfare right now is $740 for a round trip. That's really good. That's a really good price. Your stay in, at, at, in Dominican Republic with Score International uh, is $570. But that's all your lodging. That's all your meals. That's all your travel while you're there on the island. And you can fly there and stay there for $1,310 and eat there. You can't beat that for an international mission experience. And, and some of you, you know, you've been walking with Jesus for a long time. You need to do this. You need to do this. It'll be, I just, and, and listen, this is not so much about me. I've been down there so many times, but I believe in the mission. I believe in the mission that Scorn International is doing down there because it's all about Jesus for them. And I want you to experience what God has allowed me to experience. I want to take what he's poured into me and I want to pour it into you. So if you're interested in going on this trip, I want you to look at giving a $100 deposit. I will set a date here real soon to collect that $100 deposit. And this is basically just going to, going to secure our seat on the plane. It's just deposit for your seat on the plane, essentially, is what that is. SCORE is actually waiving their deposit right now um, because they want groups to go because of the pandemic and everything. They want groups to go. And so, but they're going to, uh, they're going to work all those things and so on with us. And, uh, but for the first thing, you'll have a hundred dollar deposit due. So I want to encourage you to seriously pray about that. I don't care how old you are. You can go on this trip. We can find something for you to do on this trip. And you'll be so glad you did. I've never taken people to Dominican Republic who didn't come back and say, when are we going back? It's time for you to go. I don't care what your opinions are or your excuses are. It's time to lay those on the table and be willing to go. And it'll be a great experience for you. And you'll experience the Lord in a way that you couldn't any other way. And so I want you to really seriously pray about that. And like I said, I'll communicate a deadline here soon for the deposit. If you have any questions about anything that I've said about that trip, you can message me, call me reach out to me, whatever, and uh, let me know. And uh, I'll be glad to help you with that. But for today, I want to thank you for tuning in here with me. Thank you for joining me. I hope that everything came across loud and clear. Uh, I hope that you were able to join. I am using Ecamm Live this time, and I hope that that worked well. But anyways, thank you so much. And I just want to encourage you too that if you want to give um, you know, we're not in person today at our building. If you want to give, you can go to www.sumabaptistchurch.com, click on the uh, online giving tab, and uh, you can see there all you need to do to give. We appreciate your support, especially during this time. 
And uh, I look forward to being with you again soon. And uh, until then, God bless you and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.